Okay, this is lecture number four for the course Europe and the United States in the 20th century. Um, what I am going to do is basically take us through the PowerPoints. I have already sent the PowerPoints out, so you should have them. They should be available. Um, I really just elaborate on one or two points. I'm not going to give the full 90 minute lecture now. Um, but I will go from slide to slide and perhaps elaborate on one or two points. And hopefully I'll try and keep this to, uh, to um, under 20 minutes. OK, we will we'll move on to our next slide. And we have here lecture number four, the return to isolationism, American European relations in the 1920s. Before I kind of head into this, this decade, um, I just want to begin by summarizing one or two points that we made in the last class, not least, I think I was cut off um, in terms of our online discussion uh, I was cut cut off when we got on to discussing um, uh, Woodrow Wilson returning back to the United States with the various peace agreements uh, that he'd negotiated with uh, you know with, with the Europeans um, the most significant of which of course was the Versailles Peace Treaty which effectively uh, ended the war with Germany um, and we got on to, on to, I think we started discussing um, the reasons why the US Senate actually failed to ratify the agreement. Um, and just to make a couple of points, because as I say, I think our discussion was um, truncated um, as a result of technological problems, uh, probably at my end. Um, I think we started discussing the reasons as to why the Senate failed to ratify the agreement. And the key aspect was Article 10 um, of, uh, of, of the League of Nations Covenant, which Republicans, uh, again, as I mentioned, um, you know, the Senate was in the hands of the Republican Party back in the, back in you know, the early 1920s. Uh, the Republicans were very much the isolationist party. Um, but the Republicans in general thought Article 10 was problematic because they felt that it could draw the United States into a major war. Um, that if the League of Nations or the League Council voted for some form of international interventions, the United States would be obliged to act. Um, and they believed that this article effectively sort of usurped the Senate's own prerogatives. Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, it clashed with the American uh, uh, Constitution, which ultimately gave Congress the right to declare war. So there was a, you know, there was a political dispute in that particular area. Should be said, I mean, the Republicans themselves were actually somewhat divided between those on the more pragmatic wing who would probably would have been willing to do some kind of deal with Woodrow Wilson, others who were, I suppose, labelled irreconcilables, who simply just didn't want anything to do. And I suppose the historical debate rages as to whether or not there are a sufficient number of moderates um, with whom Woodrow Wilson, had he been so inclined, um, whom Woodrow Wilson could conceivably have done some kind of deal with. The fact was that Wilson basically adopted an all or nothing approach, basically insisting that it had to be his treaty um, and, you know, nothing but his treaty, you know, that, that essentially the Republicans needed to accept um, the Versailles Peace Agreement in its entirety, especially the League of Nations, which was very much Wilson's uh, own particular, uh, um, his own brainchild, you know, he was 100% committed to that. Um, 
But ultimately, as I say, the Senate comes out and votes against the agreement. Woodrow Wilson himself, of course, is basically paralysed by a massive stroke um, in 1919. He's effectively bedridden for the rest of his uh, for the rest of his presidency. Uh, Mrs. Yeah, Mrs. Uh, Wilson um, unconstitutionally assumes many of the you know, many of the powers of the uh, presidency, or don't I say assumes, but directs you know, uses the powers of the presidency in Wilson's name. Um, but yeah, it's a sort of tragic end to the story because just at the moment where Wilson really needs to go out and sell his agreement, perhaps appeal over the heads of Congress to the American people, he is stricken, bedridden, paralysed, no longer able to perform this role. Um, 1920 presidential election basically sort of becomes a referendum on Woodrow Wilson's deal. Uh, obviously, Wilson wasn't standing again. You know, he reached the end of his second term. And as I said, he, he was suffering from acute health problems. Um, but the Democratic candidates who do stand, one of whom the vice presidential candidate was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. More about him later. Um, they stand on a sort of Wilsonian internationalist ticket. You know, they stand, they, they, you know, they, the Democratic platform very much reflects Wilson's agenda. The problem, of course, is that they lose, the Republicans take over. And as I say, the Republicans are very much the isolationist party, which brings us then on to this particular lecture. Um, and before we go there, I mean, again, just in terms of you know, thinking about Wilson and all the rest of it before we embark upon the 1920s. As I say, one, one, one of the key historical debates is, was there a, some form of potential deal to be done? And there's a couple of interesting um, um, publications on the reading list on, on the Versailles Agreement surrounding Wilson and all the rest of it. And I would uh, suggest that you, uh, um, if you're interested in this topic or you're going to write an essay on this topic, that that you could perhaps have a look at that. Okay, let's move on then into the 1920s. Um, the return to isolationism. And I suppose the key question I want to address in this class is the extent to which the United States does descend back into an isolationist policy. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think most historians would sort of agree that the 1920s is marked by you know, a fairly isolationist policy on the part of the United States. The question then becomes exactly how isolationist. And I suppose if I was going to try and make one argument today is, I suppose that it's important not to exaggerate the extent of American isolationism. Um, in other words, the United States is not entirely divorced from European affairs. In fact, in several important ways, the United States does actually make you know, quite a significant contribution uh, in terms of you know the economic structures, but also to some extent the political structures, which which you know, which are emerging or be reconstituted in Europe um, in the 1920s. So as I said, the basic argument I would make, try and make here, and I think this is reflected in some of the publications in the literature on the reading list, um, is that the United States is not entirely divorced. Okay, right, let's move on to our next slide, the world after Paris. Um, I'm going to pass over this slide pretty quickly. Um, I mean, to sum up in one sentence or two sentences, um, I think it's fair to say that most sort of historians of this period tend to view the 1920s and 1930s as a sort of prolonged crisis, which brings us to the question, maybe we'll debate this um, in our seminar class, but you know, what is a crisis? Why, why were the 1920s and 1930s viewed as a sort of crisis period in terms of international history. 
Um, a couple of important points, though, looking at this slide, which is which, which is worth noting. First of all, when you look at the international system in the 1920s and the 1930s, it is curiously Eurocentric um, in the sense that the big European powers seem to play an exaggerated role. One of the reasons for that is that at various junctures, there are sort of major powers choose to exclude themselves <coughs> excuse me choose to exclude themselves from uh, uh, from this system obviously we mentioned the united states which to some extent descends into a isolationist policy but the soviet union it's well also practices for much of the 1920s and 1930s also practices its own version of uh, isolationism um, <clears throat> when it becomes apparent that world revolution is not going to take off, Lenin effectively decides on a policy of, well, I say Lenin, actually it's ultimately Stalin, who decides on a policy of socialism in one country. In other words, try to consolidate the revolution at home and I suppose implement a fairly sort of conservative uh, approach to other countries in the late 20s and the 1930s. So notions that communist parties abroad were going to topple the various capitalist governments at least for the time being was put on hold um, so as a result of this britain and france you know despite their sort of weakened um, condition after the first world war and despite the fact that the united states and to some extent the soviet union were already emerging to become you know huge powers in their own rights Britain and France, you know, their position to some extent is exaggerated. Their importance is exaggerated in the 1920s and 1930s. The other thing to say is that Britain and France, between them, these are the two status quo powers. These are the two countries which basically want to try and uphold and enforce the Versailles settlement. So the, so the structures that emerge from the Paris Peace Conference, the international structures that emerge from the Peace Co Paris Peace Conference, is Britain and France who are going to be the two countries which are, are, are going to be seeking to uphold that. Okay, I'm going to pass over this slide, but again, one sentence. Um, when you look at the early year. 1918, 1919, into the early 1920s, the one thing that's apparent in Europe is that Central, Central and Eastern Europe especially is particularly turbulent. You have revolutions, counter-revolutions, Germany for, for a brief period, um, a communist government comes to power in Romania, you obviously have the revolutions in Russia. So this is a pretty turbulent period. Um, and again, that kind of brings us back to this idea of the 1920s, 1930s being in a period of crisis. You know, the, the, the situation in Europe from the beginning is pretty <coughs> unsettled, to put it mildly. Um, and although there, you know, there are certainly periods of relative stability in the 1920s, you, one never gets the sense that, um, you know, that uh, 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 um, we are entering into a period of prolonged stability. Okay, another slide here, Soviet introspection, um, which I've kind of more or less said, you know, we talked about socialism in one country, the Soviets pursuing, um, you know, a fairly, you know, small C conservative foreign policy, late 20s into the 1930s. Um, one thing that's worth noting is that one by one, most European governments, you know, in, from from kind of mid mid 1920s really onwards, start establishing diplomatic uh, relations with the Soviet Union. Uh, I think Britain in the 1924 Labour government is uh, is the first to do so. Other countries follow suit. The United States is fairly late. It's not until 1933 when. Uh, <clears throat> Franklin Roosevelt becomes president that the United States follows suit. But as I say, you do see um, the Soviet Union, despite having this revolutionary government, you do see the Soviet Union being sort of cautiously integrated back into the, uh, you know, the conventional international system.
the end of the Wilsonian dream. Okay. Um, and that's the question, you know, does Wilsonian die in the 1920s? And on the face of it, you can say, yes, the United States does not ratify the Versailles Treaty. The Senate rejects it, as I mentioned. Um, there's a presidential election in 1920. The Republicans win. Warren Harding becomes president um, for a period before he dies. Um, and essentially, you know, one way of interpreting that is that the United States again lapses back into um, an isolationist posture. Again, important to remember that when we talk about isolationism, we're talking about isolation from um, uh, from Europe. Uh, in other words, isolation and isolationism is about the United States not being dragged into European wars and not being uh, deeply involved in European political events and certainly not having an alliance with another European country. Okay, so the United States, as I say, kind of descended back into its policy of isolationism. One key feature of this isolationist policy is that the United States is not a member of the League of Nations. So you have this paradoxical situation that it's League of Nations, that the League of Nations chief champion had been Woodrow Wilson and yet when it is finally constructed and of course again as we noted in the previous class it's Wilson who insists that at Paris that they deal with the League before anything else and yet once the League is established the United States is not you know is not um, a fully fledged member um, which obviously means that as you know, as an effective tool for creating international stability, the League from the outset is, is you know, is hindered. It's, you know, it's the absence of the United States means that its effectiveness from the beginning is going to be relatively, uh, um, yeah, it's going to be relatively limited. On the other hand, and again, I think there has been a bit of revisionism maybe in the last decade or two about the League of Nations. I mean, the standard accounts was that the League was hopelessly ineffective right from the outset. When you look more closely, though, um, you know, there are what the League does actually chalk up one or two modest successes. One of my old lecturers, Ian Clark, used to say that the League should have been given two cheers, you know, two out of three cheers. Um, so it does, you know, it's not entirely um, ineffective certainly in the 1920s obviously in the 1930s when hitler emerges mussolini begins to challenge stalin as well begins to embark upon policies of, uh, of uh, territorial aggrandizement um you know the league basically sort of collapses but arguably any international organization uh, faced with these sorts faced with that situation and these sorts of crises would have been you, you would, would have been pretty hard pressed to uh, to, to deal with them effectively. Anyway, on this slide, you know, I list a couple of, uh, as I said, modest successes. Um, League mediates a settlement between Finland and Sweden of the Arland Islands in 1921, things like that. So, you, you, you know, as I say, there, there are one or two, one or two modest successes. Um, established a number of important agencies, World Health Organization, Labour Organization. Um, obviously, we are kind of familiar with uh, with these even today. Um, but yeah, it's important to note that the League basically um, provides a sort of blueprint which you know, subsequent international organizations and of course, especially the United Nations uh, 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 sort, of, sort of follow. You know, the United Nations basically becomes the League Mark II or a new and improved version of the League. Uh, and again, important to know, although the United States is not a full blown member of the League of Nations, the US does actually participate in a number of the League agencies. So it's not as though the United States is entirely divorced from what is happening in terms of in terms of the League. Um, international disarmament. Now, this, I think, is very much part of the Wilsonian vision and, you know, arguably this part of the Wilsonian idea persists into the 1920s. So, you know, I would say the Wilsonian flame is still flickering in the 1920s. In terms of disarmament, um, 
As part of the pop peace agreements, the defeated states, notably Germany, were to be demilitarized or disarmed. So, you know, they were forcibly disarmed. Germany loses its navy, most of its army, no heavy weapons, no air force, etc., etc. So Germany is forcibly disarmed. However, Wilson says, you know, we're going to start with Germany, but other countries should actually continue with this process afterwards. Um, and then the issue, and we've got a nice picture here. Um, the first issue that they basically turn to is um, the possibility of naval disarmament. And I think we've got a picture here of a battleship, a dreadnought battleship, which I've probably copied and pasted at some point in the past. Um, which brings us on to the 1922 Washington Conference. And I am not going to go for a blow by blow account of this conference. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of detail here um, and you know I would encourage you to uh, to look at some of the readings maybe even get onto Wikipedia or wherever to to uh, to, to uh, um, 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 learn a little bit about the technicalities what I would say just a couple of quick points about the Washington conference first of all it's the it is the first major successful effort at military disarmament in world history if i can put it that way so for the first time and several big naval powers come together and between them they agree to significant naval disarmament so that in itself is noteworthy um, it involves five powers the five big naval powers obviously being britain britain with its Royal Navy is still just about the preeminent naval power, but the United States is more or less on an equal footing. Um, the other three are Italy, Japan, and France. Um, and at the 1922 conference, they basically agree to reduce the size of their capital ships. These are the big ships in the navies, which basically meant battleships and aircraft carriers. They come up with a ratio. Um, five, three, one and a half, one and a half, I think, something like that. OK, with basically Britain and the United States having a limit of 525,000 tonnes of displacement in terms of their ships. Japan gets 60%. So again, as I said, this is the 5-3 the, the ratio here. So Japan gets 60% of that, 315,000. And then between them, France and Italy, kind of relegated to the third tier, um, 175,000. So as I say, the agreement basically covers battleships, the big ships. But they do, as I said, they do come up with a, uh, you know, they do come up with an, with, with an agreement. But it's controversial from the outset, particularly in Japan. The J Japanese are not at all happy with having been effectively given sort of second class status. There are aspirations for a wider treaty, which would include other ships as well. So not just, you know, the larger ships, but smaller vessels such as cruisers. Um, but these eventually founder. So, you know, Washington is seen, you know, at the time it's seen as a first step, but they never go much beyond be, be beyond that. Nonetheless, as I said, it's an important moment. Um, but already it's sort of becoming clear that a number of powers are are, are not entirely happy with the, with the way that this situation is is going. But as I said, you can take Washington as as evidence that even though you've got a Republican administration, there was still nonetheless um, you know a, um, you know a desire to continue with this process of of uh, of disarmament. OK, next slide, we're talking, we're talking a little bit about France, France's quest for security. As I say, yeah, this is a point that we made last week, you know, the French want above all else security. I think the problem for the French, though, is they can never quite decide how they want to achieve security. So as, from the beginning, there's a sort of debate about particularly about how they try and manage Germany or contain Germany. Um, and you get a sense that France basically vacillates between, on the one hand, a policy of wanting to impose really, really stringent terms upon Germany um, and effectively contain German power that way, or an alternative approach 
is a, an, an approach which essentially tries to engineer a Franco-German reconciliation, return Germany to the international fold, and try and you know try and overcome the bitterness of the war and essentially you know improve you know, improve relations to a degree that you know that that that, 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 that Germany would no longer be a, a a threat to French interests. I think the problem for the French is that they never really settle upon a uh, you know on a consistent policy. And as such, they more or less manage to achieve the worst possible result. Uh, you know, they don't effectively contain Germany, but they never entirely manage to sort of reconcile with Germany either. Um, initially, the French try to impose the provisions of the Versailles Treaty, especially reparations. That leads, I think I'll probably have this in, a, in, in a, another slide in a moment, but that leads to a major sort of dispute with Germany. Um, and the French army marching into the Ruhr Valley to forcibly extract reparations from Germany, which creates, you know, a significant international crisis at the beginning of the 20s. Um, they also construct what becomes known as the Little Entente in Eastern Europe, in, in the sense that they establish a series of bilateral treaties with a number of Eastern European states, basically hoping that these will act as a sort of buffer against Germany or a cordon sanitaire um but it's unclear exactly how you know how useful having these sort of relations with these you know, with these governments actually it was in terms of french interests enforcing the european settlement um so i say Again, we talked at length last class about reparations and also the debate surrounding reparations among historians about whether Germany was asked to pay too much uh, or whatever. What is clear, though, is that from the beginning, the Germans deeply resent the reparations payments that they were being that, that were demanded of them. From the beginning, there's a policy of resistance. Um, and the first part of the slide here, you know, 1920, 20, 23, 24, the German economy basically you know, collapses. Germany suffers hyperinflation. And as a result of that, um, Germany defaults on its reparations payments. As I mentioned a moment ago, France responds to this by invading the Ruhr um, to try and extract reparations. Um, but with this first, what's interesting, with this first major challenge on the part of the Germans to the first site settlement, what is striking is that there is a marked lack of solidarity among the Western states. Neither the United States nor the British actually support France. The feeling is that the French would be too demanding. Um, and as I say, in some ways, this basically kind of presages in some way, um, you know, the future. As I said, Germany challenges the treaties, you know, the Versailles Treaty, um, and each time, as I say, it doesn't really face a sort of unified response or unified opposition from Britain, France, or the United States. Um, however, the financial situation in Germany and also the rest of Europe does bring the United States back into the picture. Um, and again, this is why I think American isolationism needs to be qualified. We've already mentioned America's presence at the Washington conference, which dealt with naval disarmament. The United States is actually also quite involved in the negotiations surrounding the European economy and particularly loans and all the rest of it. Um, what is striking though, is that most of this diplomacy is not carried out by diplomats or representatives of the American government, but instead, you know, the main figures involved. And there's a couple of really interesting chapters on the reading list by uh, uh, I forget the I forget the author's name, but the book is called Lords of Finance, which goes into this in some detail. Um, but yeah, the main practitioners are, are basically U.S. financiers, bankers. So people who are not actually working for the American government per se. Um, so although the Americans are involved with these sorts of negotiations um, and you know the possibility of financial loans and things like that, um, 
as I say, the government itself is sort of doing this at arm's length, you know, not not involving itself directly, but but to some extent sort of encouraging and providing support for the American banking community. Um, and yeah, some historians call this approach dollar diplomacy, effectively, as I say, the, you know, the bankers, the financiers playing the leading role here. Um, as a result of the German financial crisis, 23, 24, um, as I said, a, a conference is convened. Should be said, by, by the time the conference is convened, the financial situation has improved quite markedly inside Germany. Um, 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 the German uh, um, central banker um, um, basically establishes a new currency and the situation is sort of brought under control by 1924. But Germany's future, of course, is, uh, is uncertain, to say the least. Um, so a conference is convened under the chairmanship of Charles Dawes, who was himself a banker, but had also been a general during the First World War. Um, he chairs the committee. Um, you know, a group of experts are called in to assess the situation, and eventually they come up with a plan. Um, Germany essentially told to you know, pay a lump sum um, in terms of its reparations payments in its first year. Uh, one billion gold marks in the first year, rise to two and a half billion after 1928. Um, in return, the United States promises a loan to Germany to help with the financial situation. Um, other things like that. And essentially, you know, they, you know, they resolve the dispute and the French withdraw from the occupation in the Ruhr. Um, great quotation from um, from uh, um, John Maynard Keynes here. This was in his book, I think, uh, or maybe it wasn't his book, but anyway, he, 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 he assesses the situation. The United States lends money to Germany. Germany transfers its equipment to the Allies. The Allies pay, pay it back to the United States government. Nothing real passes. No one is a penny the worse. The engravers dies. The printer's forms are busier, but no one eats less. No one works more. Essentially, what Keynes is saying that you have a sort of circular financial flow whereby the Americans, you know, Americans prov provide money to Germany, the G Germans use this money to pay off their debts to Britain and France, the reparations payments. Um, the British and the French use this money to pay off their own debts to the United States. So there is this sort of circular flow of money in the 1920s, which sort of works um, as long as the United States is in a position to play the role of the world's you know, major creditor. You know, the problem would come, which of course is what eventually happens, the problem would come when you know, the United States was no longer in a position to actually, um, to actually you know, provide, uh, provide uh, uh, this, this credit. Um, so yeah, as I say, Dawes plan, 24. Already, though, Germany is starting to be rehabilitated. I mean, Germany, 1919-1920, is sort of like treated as the equivalent of North Korea today, you know, pretty much beyond the pale. By the early 1920s, though, Germany is sort of tentatively reintroduced to international life. Um, Germany participates in the Genoa conference in 1922, it's an economic conference. Whilst there, the Russian and German delegations um, take a trip up the road to another resort, Rapallo, where they agree a treaty which establishes German-Russian cooperation, diplomatically recognize each other, begin clandestine military cooperation as well. Um, then after doors, Germany also participates at in Locarno. Um, again, sometimes in the textbooks, Germany is sort of treated, you know, mid-20s Germany is sort of treated as this time where, 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 where Germany is, is, is now beginning to be kind of reconciled with the you know, post-war international order. I think, again, many historians kind of question this, you know, they... they, they there's plenty of evidence which, which should suggest that right the way throughout the period that 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 that, that, 
the Germans are sort of inherently revisionist, as this quotation here suggests. You know, this is the German army chief. 1920, Poland's existence is intolerable, incompatible with the survival of Germany. It must disappear. It will disappear either through its own internal weakness or through our own assistance. So essentially, you know, from the beginning, there are plenty of Germans, German nationalists who, who are seeking to unpick the uh, Versailles Treaty. Nonetheless, as I say, 1925, you have the Locarno uh, Treaty, often viewed as a sort of high watermark of 1920s cooperation. Germany is sort of treated as an equal, voluntarily accepts the, the treaties. Um, all parties recognize Western Europe's existing frontiers. Um, Britain guarantees French and German security. What's conspicuous though by Locarno is that there's no clear mention given to Eastern Europe. Um, the Polish leader Pasutski later states that, you know, all true Poles spit at the word of Locarno. So already, you know, again, historians, some historians at least, say Locarno is the first step in a policy which would later become known as appeasement. Essentially saying to Germany, you know, as long as you recognise, you know, as long as you recognise, you know, the status quo in Western Europe, we will give you, if not a free hand in the East, then at least, you know, we will be prepared to allow you to significantly change the settlement in Eastern Europe. Um, again, going back to France, you know, not being able to consistently pursue one policy. So, you know, at Locarno, you, that, that is an indication, if you like, of an effort to try and reconcile with Germany. However, after Locarno, France begins to construct the Maginot Line, which again is, you know, it, it's a very um, clear um, indication, if you like, of a lack of French trust in Germany's intention. So on the one hand, as I say, trying to deal with Germany diplomatically while still hunkering down behind the Maginot Line. Um, 1920, you know, mid-1920s, it's seemingly, you know, the world economy is beginning to improve. Political stability is apparently returning to Europe. The Weimar Republic seems to have got over the worst um, and looking perhaps more, st more stable than it had done in the past. Um, on the other hand, you know, there are indications that, you know, beneath it all, you know, the underlying situation is not necessarily 100% healthy. Notably, the United States is still pretty protectionist in its attitudes. So tariffs, you know, there are significant tariffs um, protecting the US home market, which obviously, to some extent, kind of dampens down um, international trade. Uh, again, I'm going to pass over this slide, but it's also important to note that there is some degree of rivalry between the British and the United States. 1920s, both Britain and the United States are sort of vying with each other to be the two financial powers in the international system. Um, there's pressure on Britain to go back onto the gold standard from the United States, which Churchill, fatefully, Churchill as Chancellor, as the, Chancellor of the Exchequer in the mid-1920s, Churchill fatefully you know, fatefully takes this, makes the decision, puts Britain back on gold. The effect of which is actually to kind of limit the liquidity in the British economy. And actually, you know, it, 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 it sort of holds, holds Britain back. So it's seen as, you know, it's seen as, as, you know, ultimately as a you know, fairly bad decision. Um, competition between British and American oil companies in the Middle East. So, as I say, that you know, there is an element of competition between Britain and the United States. You know, we're still not yet at the stage of the special relationship. Towards the end of the 20s, the Pact of Paris or the kellogg briand Pact. Again, you could, you know, you could point to this as an indication that Wilsonianism was not dead. Um, very simply, the Pact of Paris was agreement that countries would not resort to war to resolve their disputes and eventually, you know, virtually all the world's you know, major states signed this, including Germany and the Soviet Union. 
Um, the problem with the pact, of course, though, is that it's basically unenforceable. So, you know, it's one thing for countries to pledge they would not use force, quite another to force them to do so. End of the 1920s, there's a second economic plan to deal with the situation in Germany. Um, by this point, it's becoming clear that the European economy is beginning to run into difficulties. I say the European economy, but also uh, the international economy, the United States as well. So this plan was uh, 1929. Um, and one thing that comes clear, I mean, when you read about the Young Plan, one thing that comes becomes clear is that the negotiations themselves are pretty bitter, especially between the Germans and the French. The Germans suspect that the, the, the sorry, the French suspect that the Germans are trying to wriggle out of their reparations payments. Um, so it's a, you know, it's, it's a very bad tempered affair. Nonetheless, they do come to an agreement whereby uh, Germany's uh, uh, payments would be rescheduled to make them, you know, to make them uh, more, um, um, sorry, to make them less burdensome. Um, the reparations commission was to be abolished, which was to assess the extent to which Germany was uh, was complying with the uh, with the with the agreements. German financial independence restored, and, and there was an agreement that the Rhineland would be finally uh, evacuated. Um, so again, another you know point along along the road in terms of uh, of uh, you know, managing the situation. The problem is, though, as I say, the, you know when the you know, when the conference is convened, it's already clear that the financial situation was was, was running into trouble. Um, between the end of the conference and the implementation of the plans provisions, you have the Wall Street crash, which basically sends you know, sends the international uh, economic and financial system into turmoil. And again, we'll, uh, we'll come back onto that point uh, in more detail next week. So yeah, to conclude, you know, as you can see in the conclusion, you know, mid 1920s, especially, I think that it appears that the international situation seems to be improving. The economic and financial situation seems to be improving. But the problem, as I say, that is that it rests on weak foundations. It essentially rests on the willingness and the ability of the United States to provide credit to, to, to the Europeans and especially to Germany. As I say, you know, once this, you know, once this source of money, once this liquidity um, is turned off, which of course is what eventually happens with the crash in 1929, um, inevitably, you know, they were going to be. Uh, you yeah, know, the, the global economy, the European economy was going to uh, face some pretty um, um, difficult conditions. Okay, so we'll finish there uh, today. I've actually went on rather longer than I um, actually anticipated. Um, I'll try and keep them maybe a little bit shorter in, in, in the future. Um, and yeah, just to remind you that we will have our, um, you know, online discussion um, Monday, Monday morning next week, 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock. So hopefully I will see you all or at least most of you then. Thank you very much.